this was one of my favorite places to escape to. Enjoying nature, taking long, quiet walks alone. Well, sort of alone. Listening to the ocean. Or simply observing the unique and fantastic wildlife. Indeed, it is a place like no other, purchased by the federal government in an attempt to protect and restore native flora and fauna, some of which had been threatened with extinction. But the success story of the seashore acts as a veil over a lesser known story. And the more I learned about this story, the harder it was for me to ignore. I just saw more cows in five minutes of driving than there are elk in all of Point Reyes National Seashore. I said that with intentional humor at the time, but as I was to find out, there was a sobering amount of truth to it. Turns out there are more cattle just in this section of land designated as a national seashore than there are tule elk in the world. Hi. My name is Skylar Thomas, and I'd like to invite you on my personal journey of eye-opening in Point Reyes National Seashore. Yep, there's going to be a lot of poop. Normally, I'm making films about sharks, and Point Reyes was just a beautiful place fairly close to me that I would go to for some natural therapy and a break from the computer and editing. But little did I know that before this journey was over, sharks would be a part of this story as well. Let me state that I don't have a personal problem with cows. In fact, it's more likely that we don't give cows the credit that they might deserve, even when they occasionally block the road. But none of that changes the reality of what comes with these industries. Now, what on earth am I talking about and why? Well, it all started with these things on my left. If I hadn't seen these, I may not have told this story at all, but I did see them. And instead of just driving by, I found out what they were. In retrospect, it's strange that I hadn't thought more about the sheer numbers of cattle out there. But like many of us, it's just what I was used to seeing. In fact, the entire drive out to Point Reyes, both sides of the road are bordered by agriculture of some kind, including livestock. So when it continued on into the park, I didn't think much of it and probably wouldn't have thought much more of it until I started seeing articles about plans to kill the elk on behalf of the cattle. Apparently some of the elk were showing up on ranch lands and were supposedly creating a threat to the ranching business by eating grass and damaging fences. So these amazing native animals that the seashore helped bring back from the brink of extinction and that the tourists loved to take pictures of were being presented as the bad guys. This caused me to start asking other questions. For example, what were these private ranches doing on the public land of a national seashore in the first place? Well, I walked into a big cow patty asking that question. About the same time these questions were occurring to me, the ranchers, with the assistance of their politicians and lobbyists, were attempting to push through a bill that would protect the ranches, allow for expansion of ranching, and even promote the killing of wildlife. I may not have been a politician, or an ecologist, but I did still have my eyes, and I began to see the seashore very differently. Sometimes I don't think we fully comprehend what we are witnessing, myself included, so I'm gonna take a moment to count the cows on this side and directly opposite, and see just how many there are. Right here. One, two, three, 
four, on the side. Did I count you? You are so chill. If you look behind me, you can see a few more of the elk over here in the Drake's Beach area. This handful of elk are such a problem that they need to be killed. Even though the tourists stop and love to take pictures of them. And where are you visiting from? We're visiting from Georgia. All right, and what attracted you to Point Reyes National Seashore? We love nature and we were staying in San Francisco, but really wanted to get out of the city and experience some of the coastline before we headed into the national parks. So are you here for nature or for the dairy ranches? We actually didn't even know there were cows out here, so that was a surprise to us, but we were out here for nature. Thank you very much. I just couldn't wrap my head around killing beautiful wild animals within a national park unit while the cattle littered the horizon like a plague, especially when the public seemed so drawn to the elk. After all, it was public land. Didn't the public's opinion matter? Or was I getting the wrong picture? Did the public actually prefer ranching and cows? Turns out the park service already had that answer via their own survey. In overwhelming results, no doubt remained that the public preferred the prioritization of wildlife and wilderness. When asked why having a national park was important, the number one answer was to protect wildlife habitat. Number two was to protect rare species. Three was to preserve native ecosystems and so on down the list. Interestingly, what the public desires for the park matches what the park's legislation says the intentions of the park were for. Allow me to read from the enabling legislation while showing the desires expressed in the public survey. In order to save and preserve for purposes of public recreation, benefit, and inspiration, a portion of the diminishing seashore of the United States that remains undeveloped without impairment of its natural values in a manner which provides for such recreational, educational, historic preservation, interpretation, and scientific research opportunities as are consistent with, based upon, and supportive of the maximum protection, restoration, and preservation of the natural environment within the area. Notice the absence of expressed desire for the continuation of ranching in the legislation. While in the public survey, of the options offered, preservation of the dairies and ranches came in last. Second to last was to generate income for the local economy. But that hardly mattered because generating income for the local economy just happened naturally thanks to the wilderness attracting tourists ranging from nearby to international. The rare argument that people come to the seashore to see cows and dairies seemed to defy logic, particularly since these things can be seen the entire drive prior to entering the seashore. From reading the survey, I learned that even within the seashore, less than half of it was designated as wilderness. 92% of those surveyed responded in support of keeping designated wilderness areas. When asked what the public would like to see increased, the number one answer was the amount of wilderness area, while the number one answer for what people would like to see decreased was the amount of land used for ranching. After reading these results, I went to see the public comments submitted in response to the park's proposal to kill the elk in favor of the ranches, the results of which were again overwhelmingly and passionately against that plan. So between the park's own survey results and the public comments submitted, I had to wonder if the park actually cared what the public wanted or if the desires of the ranchers would trump all. Trumping all turned out to be an appropriate phrase considering this administration's war on public lands. Between being federal employees under an extremely wildlife hostile administration and being located in an isolated environment in the heart of a major agricultural county, the Park Service staff were in a difficult situation. <laughs> 
I wasn't the only one finding this all a little suspicious. In fact, it warranted a former staff member of the Point Reyes National Park Service to speak out. During the four years I worked in Point Reyes as a plant ecologist, I was not the only employee who believed the ranches had unacceptable environmental and social impacts. But it seemed that the Park Service could not or simply chose not to address the issue head on, not until they were sued over those impacts. Part of the legal agreement was to complete a comprehensive environmental assessment of the ranches and subsequent general management plan within four years. Then suddenly out of left field comes this bill by Jared Huffman that attempted an end run around the settlement process, basically ordering the National Park Service to issue 20 year leases and expressly putting the needs of ranches above the needs of natural resources and native wildlife. Why did a congressman, previously considered an environmentalist, try to force the Park Service to change the national seashores enabling legislation ahead of the environmental assessment of the impacts of the ranches? Perhaps because they knew at least some of the impacts of ranching on the environment at Point Reyes National Seashore would be, per the National Environmental Policy Act, significant. As an attorney for the Park Service uh, for several years in my early career, um, I'm sad when I see such a violation of duties uh, on the part of the Park Service, but that's just the way it is. And it's because uh, they've bowed to pressure from the meat or ag industry, whatever layer of the onion you want to refer to in terms of uh, uh, political pressure, uh, has uh, gotten them to ignore their duties. The Park Service has been in violation of its duties at Point Reyes uh, since uh, it acquired the ranch lands. How do you explain that? Well, uh, nobody's done anything about it until a group of environmentalists sued them in, in 2016 to get them to start following the law. And the first law that they got them to follow, and they agreed, the Park Service and the ranchers who intervened agreed to do it, was to conduct this planning process that's ongoing now. All right, let me get this straight. Since the creation of the seashore, the Park Service has failed to produce a single environmental impact statement regarding the effects of the ranches? That sounds weird. They haven't updated their general management plan in 38 years? That also sounds weird. The native animals are a problem, but the cattle are not? That too sounds weird. A corrupted politician turns his back on the environment? Okay, that sounds normal. Hi, can I talk to you for a moment about our elk problem at Point Reyes National Seashore? It's the elk that are eating too much grass. It's the elk wreaking havoc on the habitat. We've got to manage their numbers. Too many elk eating too much grass. Just to be clear on this problem, there are too many elk in the national park. Seriously though, this elk problem. Too many elk. Too many elk eating too much grass. Too many elk. Elk eating grass is the problem. Dear Feinstein, dear Huffman, thank you for bringing to our attention the problem of all the elk in this national park. There's nothing suspicious about your stance on this topic at all. All joking aside, an examination of the numbers changes this from being a strange argument to a ridiculous one. On the topic of water, one of the sadder stories I learned was that of the elk die-off during the 2012 to 2014 drought, during which the fenced-in animals were denied access to water. This was justified because droughts are naturally occurring events and animals die off in such events. 
I would argue that animals aren't naturally prevented from being able to move to water sources. Imagine yourself dying of thirst, not being really thirsty, but actually dying from the lack of water while being denied a fighting chance to find water, even as the neighboring cattle continue to drink thousands of gallons per day. To die of thirst when you have water all around you, all about you, and to die of thirst can be one of the most agonizing things a human being or a four-legged, for that matter, any of creator's creatures to go through. You can see their hoof prints in the seep as they were trying to drink water from the seep, which involved basically drinking some, some dirt as well. I met a man who told me that he f saw during the drought a dead elk that had a mouth full of, of uh, dried dirt, which I believe was uh, its way of trying to get the last bit of moisture it could, uh, putting the uh, wet mud in its mouth and trying to get as much of the contents of the water in the mud as possible, and it wasn't enough to keep it alive. In the end, approximately 250 elk, 46% of the Pierce Point herd, died. There are no records of any cattle dying during the same time period. Without question, the drought story is sad, but I was confused as to whether it was a negligent mistake in stewardship or a conscious decision not to help. In reviewing news articles from the time period, I found that Dave Press, the park's wildlife ecologist, claimed that elk were being watched carefully, while simultaneously stating there were no outward signs of a problem. But in another article, the park rangers stated that they had noticed the ponds in the reserve had gone dry early in 2013. Another year went by without action. The 2012 to 2014 drought is one of the worst in recent history. So I'm curious what signs, other than corpses after the fact, the park was looking for. Quote, the decline was drought related, but the mechanism is not known. Let me help out with that. The mechanism is called not drinking water, but the insistence that this was a natural phenomenon continued to be repeated. As a Native American that's traveled up and down the state of California, that's tracked the elk throughout the state of California from San Diego to Riverside to the Tahoe region to Northern California where the Roosevelt elk are here at Point Reyes, that's not only a fallacy, but that's misdirection. The Park Service people, the, what, what my older people call the uniform people, are supposed to be a fiduciary. They're supposed to be a trustee. They're supposed to take care of the public interest of the land. They're supposed to uphold the spirit and intent with which the Point Reyes National Seashore was created. They're supposed to protect the Point Reyes Tule Elk. They did not do that. If the uniformed people did anything, they let them down. Jared Huffman chimed in, showing his pro ranching colors even back then. Transforming from a politician to an elk expert, stating that the herd was bigger than carry capacity would allow. But we do need to find out how a lack of water contributed to the lower numbers in the last few years. Again, I can solve the mystery. Death is a common symptom of not drinking water. Elk experts, independent of the Park Service, do not believe that what had been a thriving population of the elk was at a carrying capacity that would justify a nearly 50% decline in the population in just a two-year period. And when the Center for Biological Diversity argued that the elk should be allowed to roam, Stacy Carlson, Marin County's Agricultural Commissioner, callously responded, they would be fine inside the fences as long as the herd is managed. They were not supposed to be on the pastoral lands where they have caused damage. First of all, the elk that died were the fenced-in elk, not the elk occasionally found on pastoral lands. In fact, the herd outside the fenced area with access to water grew by a third during the same time period the herd without water fell by half. 
but her comment does show an out of context attempt to spread sympathy for the ranchers who openly disliked and complained about the elk presence. Her statement about damage provides an opportunity to share some information I gained thanks to documents acquired by the Center for Biological Diversity's Freedom of Information Act request. In emails exchanged by the Park Service staff, it was revealed that ranchers made claims of damage to property while refusing the Park Service's request to inspect the damage or help repair the damage. Nevertheless, the Park Service still compensated the ranchers despite the lack of evidence. The documents further revealed that ranchers harassed elk with their dogs and their ATVs, caused elk entanglement via improperly discarded wire, some of which led to lethal results, and that the cattle frequently and regularly trespass into non-grazing areas where they are not allowed. It was increasingly difficult not to recognize a trend in which action would be taken against wildlife while violations by ranchers consistently went without consequence. The Wildlife vs. Cattle platform caused me to notice things that I hadn't before, which in turn prompted me to seek the advice of biologists, ecologists, and environmental attorneys to help me better understand what I was witnessing. For example, it became blaringly clear that wherever I was seeing terrain damage was also where ranching activity was taking place. Erosion on the hills where cattle traveled, including trails that eventually became ruts that became permanent scars in the landscape due to the continual use of high numbers of exceptionally heavy animals. Yet within the elk reserve, even in high use areas, I never saw the same effects on the terrain. I also began to understand which plants were native and which were foreign. Some specifically introduced and grown for the sake of feeding the cattle, such as the different plants making up silage. Sadly, I also learned that various species of native birds and small mammals nest in this silage and are consequently mowed down in the spring harvest, just as the newborns are emerging. I also learned that certain noxious weeds thrived in a high E. coli manure-based environment, consequently choking out native plants that cannot compete in the altered habitat. The hyperfertilization is also responsible for plant growth over what would otherwise be open bodies of water, again affecting wildlife in ways that wouldn't occur to most of us. Perhaps nothing illustrates the issue better than this single camera pan shot in Point Reyes National Seashore from land free from cattle grazing to land subjected to cattle grazing. Certain sources would have you believe that these cattle are actually enhancing the habitat. Author, ecologist, paleontologist, and director of the Western Watersheds Project California Division, Laura Cunningham, disagrees. This is the worst example of land management I've ever seen in all my years examining lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management and U.S. Forest Service. Now, how do you explain conditions like that in such an exquisite location, such as this national seashore? In the heart of the Bay Area, the park is allowing severe soil erosion, water quality degradation, and impacts to rare, threatened, and endangered species. The state and federal government are giving free passes and waivers for water pollution, which is harming sensitive marine resources. The following are quotes taken directly from the Point Reyes National Seashore 2013 Coastal Watershed Assessment, which was funded by the National Park Service. The effects of historic grazing are evident and pervasive, including gully erosion, soil compaction, nutrient enrichment, altered hydrology, increased vegetative cover of non-native plant species and non-native pasture species that have naturalized from plantings and are now expanding into adjacent areas. Extremely high fecal coliform concentrations have been documented in the streams adjacent to the existing dairy operations at Point Reyes National Seashore. Manure spreading areas are correlated with increased presence of invasive and noxious weed species. Streams and tributaries leading to Drake's Estero, a federally protected wilderness area, adjacent to dairy operations, A Ranch, B Ranch, C Ranch. All of these streams and tributaries had significant numbers of dissolved oxygen samples that were below the optimum levels. 
which have significant implications for fish in these streams. When I first read that these Holstein dairy cows eat 50 pounds of dry forage per day on estimate, I was like, wow, that sounds like a lot, especially compared to a tule elk, which is nine pounds a day. But you watch these guys, holy moly, can they eat. And you know what that means? Yep, that's right. So let's talk about poop for a while, starting with this figure. Ranch lands managed by Point Reyes National Seashore produce a total of 133,533,900 pounds of manure annually. Yes, I said 133 million. And it all has to go somewhere. Both dried and liquefied manure are spread across the seashore, distributed via truck, sprinkler, as well as natural spreading via rain and seepage. Cows are fond of defecating in ponds around the seashore, and some ponds are built just for the purpose of collecting and liquefying manure, which can then be distributed at a later time. They're called poop ponds. Yeah, that's a real term. And yes, that's a manure sprinkler you're seeing in the background. And those are organic dairy cows, tightly confined in a pen of their own excrement. In 1979, 50% of cattle herds in Point Reyes tested positive for Yoni's disease, a wasting disease born of confinement, which infects an estimated two-thirds of the nation's dairy industry and is spread through fecal matter. While discussing the effects of manure on the local habitat, someone presented to me the argument that Hey, elk poop too. Yeah, good point. That's about the same. Even if the two were comparable, one is from a native animal eating and defecating a fraction of the amount of the hordes of non-native animals. Observing the cattle waste in Point Reyes begs one to wonder what the effects of this much manure might be. Yet propaganda was spread that it was the elk responsible for this disease. Science doesn't support this claim, the history of dairy doesn't support this claim, and the reality of the filthy confinement of large numbers of domestic animals doesn't support this claim. And yet, in another puzzling chapter of the seashore's history, rather than addressing the threat posed by the cattle to wildlife, attention was instead diverted to dealing with the elk. 25 of which were killed to collect tissue samples while the cattle went untested. I suppose the 1979 study was damaging enough not to ever want to expose proud organic operations again. At first it was hard for me to connect such a beautiful location to the supposed saturation of feces. But further research revealed that the waters of this national seashore rank in the top 10% of locations in the United States most contaminated by feces, as indicated by E. coli bacteria. A 2017 report published by The Revelator disclosed that Point Reyes National Seashore has been one of the 10 most feces-contaminated locations in California monitored since 2012. The state's highest recorded E. coli level was on a Point Reyes cattle ranch. If that's still not enough to make a connection, perhaps one needs to imagine the waste running down the hills to where the beloved elephant seals are playing in the surf. Dairies and ranches at Point Reyes National Seashore are associated with myriad other impacts to riparian and wetland processes at Point Reyes. The long short is the National Seashore shouldn't be making lists for the 10 crappiest places in the United States. It shouldn't be on at the top of any list for water pollution in California. It's a National Seashore. <laughs>
About this time, David McGuire, director of Shark Stewards, had contacted me regarding concerns of water contamination in Point Reyes, stating that he had seen a white shark go by while diving at the Drake's Estero opening, but the water reeked of urine and cattle were defecating on the beach. And then something occurred to me that should have been obvious, an age-old lesson from Mother Nature, that everything is connected. This was a white shark aggregation site, and you didn't have to take my word for it or the presence of the shark's food source as evidence. Noah's own assessment of the area shows Point Reyes as a crucial aggregation site for white sharks. So there it was. Sharks had managed to still be a part of my story about cows. I'm now at Drake's Estero and I had been hoping to go paddle boarding, but the area is closed due to the harbor seal pupping season, which, you know, I respect, but, you know, <laughs> this place is covered, covered in cow manure. How does that not affect pupping season? I don't mean a little bit. I mean, it's covered. I stepped out of my car into manure. Everywhere along here, manure. Holy moly. I was not exaggerating. Dry manure, wet manure, medium manure, 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 manure. This water looks terrible. This is what harbor seals have to pup in? You could say that my original adoration of the seashore was beginning to be altered. But I had a lot more to learn. You may have noticed that the cattle in my footage are predominantly female. Seemingly new mothers or expecting mothers. So where were their babies? I visited the pins several times, and something I noticed was that they were quiet. You know, they were silent animals for the most part, just standing inside of their plastic enclosures. Or right outside of them, not like they had other options. But, for the most part, they were quiet. It wasn't until later visits that I began to realize there was some bellowing, seemingly coming from the far end of the rows of pins. They've actually added more pins since last time we were here. Look at him, Sharon. Look how desperately he's trying to get to me. I'm sorry, buddy. I wish I could do more for you. I wonder if those ones bellowing over there are, have been freshly taken from their mothers and haven't, you know, just resigned themselves to this existence yet. I come over here. 
verifies my suspicion that these are the ones that have been just taken from their mothers. Look at how tiny you are, you poor thing. Have you ever touched your mother ever in your life? You poor thing. I won't hurt you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we're so cruel to you. I'm sorry. I know. Where's your mommy? As I looked into their eyes, I found myself unpleasantly imagining the changes that must take place in an animal that goes from pleading for its mother to ones that have simply fallen silent. Shortly after entering the world, this had become their world. The longer I stayed, the harder it became. If I had just snuck a peek and then left, that would be one thing. But the more time I spent there, the more I witnessed the animals coming out of their shells, observing me with a mixture of hope, fear, and confusion. You poor thing. Where's your mom? Where's your mommy? My compassion for animals that many of us see as little more than breathing commodities may seem extreme. That aside, let's review where we stand so far. A politician authors and attempts to push through a bill on behalf of the ranchers. The water is contaminated, the soil poisoned, land eroded, wildlife threatened, native plants choked out by agricultural weeds, and the magnificent tule elk face a coal. But hey, at least babies are taken from their mothers as a standard practice of the industry that's responsible for all of the above. Dairies don't exist without pregnant cows. Therefore, these calf enclosures can be found throughout the seashore. But sometimes you have to look a little harder to see them. I keep hearing about these small, family farms. But who defines small? The number of cattle allowed on these ranches qualifies some of them as mega dairies. And in multiple cases, the ranches were found to have violated their leases by greatly exceeding their allotted number of cattle. This means the total number of cattle in the seashore quoted earlier is likely very conservative with the majority being inseminated females. This means hundreds of babies are born every year. The new males will be sent to veal farms or auctioned off as cheap meat while they are still babies. And the females will face the same fate of their mothers, a short life perpetually pregnant without children before being sent to slaughter themselves when their bodies are spent from overproduction at a premature age. <laughs> 
examining issues regarding highly visible animals, such as elk and cattle, is one thing. But what about smaller animals, birds, or those that prefer to remain out of sight? The influence the ranches have on bird behavior can be confirmed through simple observation. But the impacts were great enough to warrant a study in 1999, which recommended alteration of land use, i.e. ranching, to help control the raven population and help reduce depredation. Quote, immediate changes by dairy ranches could include covering food troughs, setting up exclusion fencing to keep cows away from sensitive areas, and immediate removal of raven food sources, such as afterbirths and calf carcasses. Yay! Calf carcasses are an issue in the National Seashore. Great! But these impacts paled in comparison to that of the annual silage mowing, the effects of which were concerning enough to warrant another study. Issued by Point Blue and delivered to the Park Service in 2015. I'd heard of the harvest before, but this year I witnessed it. It's hard to say from a distance exactly what the ravens were trying to eat. Insects, small mammals, birds, reptiles, basically any animal suddenly exposed in the mowed fields. Or perhaps they were just scavenging for the remains of the slain. All those signs on the beaches about trying to protect the snowy plovers? Guess what the number one problem is? And guess who's promoting that problem? The Point Blue report stated the following. Several studies have found that the agricultural practice of mowing, whether for silage or hay, has detrimental impact to breeding birds because nests, flightless young, and sometimes adults, are destroyed. In point rays, prior to mowing, there were eight bird species confirmed or suspected of breeding in the silage fields. Four of these were ground nesting species. Following the mowing, it was found that species abundance and richness both fell. The only bird numbers that increased were the non-native ravens, which have clearly learned this is an annual feeding opportunity. The study also stated that on two occasions, flocks of about 35 individuals were observed foraging on the ground in a recently mowed field, apparently scavenging for food items that were likely made accessible by the mowing, including one observation of what appeared to be a dead pocket gopher. Okay, I'm gonna take a walk in this field and see kind of carnage I can find or maybe if I walk through the unmowed parts I can find some animals that are still alive and see what it's like before death. Well, yeah, I guess we got a badger hole or something like that here. Good luck to you. I think these guys will probably come back tomorrow to finish the job. I know it's a little gross for me to touch that, but I wanted to make sure I understood what I was seeing. I suspected it was blood. And then you see the bone fragments and the guts also. <laughs> what a way to die, huh? Sitting in your nest and suddenly you are chopped up. You can see by the uh, scraps of the animal that I just found that there's not much left from these mower blades. So silage basically means plants and animals all chopped up together. Having read the report, I knew that one of the many recommendations provided by Point Blue to reduce impacts to wildlife was to mow the fields starting from the inside out, thus allowing animals a better chance to escape. 
I was witnessing the exact opposite. This is bad news for most animals, but particularly deer, who are known to hide their young in tall grass, and also known to use freezing as a survival technique. In the time I sat there, my camera captured one deer successfully fleeing the field. but also captured the remains of a chopped up fawn being dragged away by an opportunistic coyote. As sad as the scene was, I was surprised to find fond memories from my childhood awakened, such as sitting on my dad's lap pretending to drive the giant combine, or playing in the backs of the grain-filled trucks with my friends all of this during harvest in the agricultural land that I grew up in. But this was no longer the same world as when I was a child. Just in the time it took me to grow from a kid on my father's lap to the adult I am now, we had wiped out an astonishing 50% of other life on this planet. The animals that mesmerized me as a child are routinely eradicated for urban sprawl and agriculture while we treat announcements of new endangered species as casually as if someone were reading the scores from last night's sports game. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, farming and ranching are responsible for 68% of all species endangerment in the United States. That's rather forthcoming considering a section of the federal government abusively titled Wildlife Services killed 1.3 million native animals last year on behalf of agriculture. So when I see coyotes scavenging the silage field, I don't see a pest. I see an animal trying to survive in a world where wildlife services killed 69,000 of just that species in one year. I've been watching tourists walk down to the lagoon and I finally stopped one, decided to ask her about why she was here and what she thought about what she was seeing. So you are visiting from Australia? Yeah. And what yeah. brought you to Point Reyes today? Um, we actually came to photograph the medicinal plants, the Californian poppies, and to really just be amidst nature and connect with the plants. Is there any yeah. attraction to the park regarding the ranches? Not at all. It's upsetting actually, just hearing what they're doing. And it seems like it's such a beautiful nature scape. So even to see their trucks and the noises seem so foreign and like they shouldn't be here. What yeah. about the cheese? Do you, you plan on buying any cheese? Oh, I didn't even notice the cheese, no. You're not going to buy any cheese or no. milk products in town? Not at all, no. This is so much bigger than just us. And taking care of the earth is beyond just, and nature is just uh, beyond our small lives, you know? So I guess being, um, understanding that of course every family has to survive and take care of themselves. And I understand that people are farmers and ranchers and, um, there just should be there should be places that are that are just left to be you know I think not every land needs to be farmed not every you know not everything needs to be taken over we're just lacking wild places of course the irony of her words being that this land was recognized as being worthy of preservation and restoration prompting the federal government to pay the ranchers millions of dollars for their land making the seashore the newest member of the national park system. So 50 years later, the big question is, why are they still here? In order to get the legislation moving against the opposition of the ranchers, the Park Service decided to give up its condemnation powers as long as ranchers uh, just kept ranching and didn't uh, sell to a subdivider, which was going on or beginning out there. So uh, the, the uh, law got passed with the limitation that the Park Service couldn't condemn the ranches so long as they kept ranching, they, they could remain. However, some ranchers started selling to the Park Service and the Park Service was giving them leasebacks of some kind where they could stay for another 20 or whatever years. And uh, more, more ranchers liked that. And so uh, there began this process where ranchers started selling to the Park Service. The Park Service would give them the right to stay for 20 or whatever years. Ultimately, what happened is those leases started to expire and John Sansing, who was the superintendent from the early 70s, I think, until the mid-90s, he decided to keep giving them more leases of shorter duration than their original ones. That should not have happened. That should have been the time 
that the park should have stopped and said, we need to make a decision on whether ranching should continue or whether these lands should be used as parks are meant to be used. An analogy to what's going on at Point Reyes would be how we bought up parks in California for redwoods. The state and federal redwood parks were all owned by private landowners at one time. If you can imagine what it would be like today, what people would say if the original owners were still logging the redwoods there, people would be outraged. Yet in many ways, that's the same thing that's happening at Point Reyes, where we paid to protect it as a national seashore, and yet it's still being used for livestock production. So what was the intention of the seashore? The enabling legislation seems rather clear with its intentions, and yet a heated debate rages to this day between ranchers and environmentalists as to what was intended. One side of the argument claims that the ranchers have exceeded their stay, while the other side claims Congress always intended for the ranchers to stay. On the contrary, I found a history of hiring lobbyists and courting favor with politicians in an ongoing effort to reinterpret and amend the original legislation, most recently being Huffman's bill that would have given the ranchers at least another 20 years, exempt from any forthcoming environmental impact statements. This quote by Phyllis Faber, founding member of RAG, Resilient Agriculture Group, one of the groups that the pro-ranching community formed for their lobbying efforts, stated, all we want to do is change the founding legislation so that ranching is guaranteed. Gee, is that all you want? To change the founding legislation to be exactly what you want it to be? I have a question. If the founding legislation supposedly already states that ranching was meant to continue there, then why does it need to be changed? Let me try to understand the argument. In recognition of our disappearing natural places in a nation dominated by livestock agriculture, Congress saw fit to add this seashore to its national park system, but also thought that the dairies were so special that they needed to be preserved as well? Hmm, where or where in the United States can you find anything like this? Pick a highway. Drive from San Francisco to Sacramento. Drive from San Francisco to Yosemite. Drive from Northern California to Southern California. If it's not urban, ocean, or mountainous forest, it's agriculture. And yet we can't preserve this one strip of land for the wildlife, even though we've already paid for it. I think it's about time for another review of where we stand. The beautiful native tule elk, the top attraction of tourists who fuel the local economy, are a problem. The impacts of ranching, along with poor management by the Park Service, have led a national seashore to be one of the crappiest places in the nation. Ranching promotes populations of ravens that kill native birds, and spring babies of native animals are mowed down during the harvest of invasive plants that are intentionally grown as part of a self-declared sustainable practice that is so sustainable that it requires thousands of acres of grazing land tons of additional feed in the form of silage, tons of hay imported from the Central Valley, and thousands of gallons of water per day. The industry is so sustainable that it costs the United States billions of dollars in subsidies every year. On the upside, it turns out that these products aren't even good for you. Quick idea, what if we took a tiny fraction of the annual subsidies our government gives to the dairy industry and paid these ranchers again? Let them walk away as millionaires once again. I don't care how much money they have. Just save the land. The other thing about uh, sustainability is, uh, particularly again, is what we're talking about in a, in a national park unit, is we want to sustain the native ecosystems and the native wildlife. And uh, it's just not appropriate to, even if the farming there was sustainable, which I would argue it is not, but even if it was, that's an inappropriate place to be practicing sustainability. Uh, do it on the other private lands. There's a lot of private land in Marin County and in the rest of California. Only 50% of California is public. So 50% or about 50 million acres is private. Go out there and show me your sustainability. We don't need to do it in the National Park Unit. A lot of the promotion of grazing and meat and local 
you know, organic dairy, it really relies on these sorts of false dichotomies where it is nice that we don't have the high rises. It is lovely that it's just sort of open land, but it doesn't need to be open land that's grazed. And I think here there are sort of two problems really. One is that, you know, in Marin County, you do have, you did have the creation of a land trust that allowed a lot of land to be protected from development as farmland instead. In a way, that's a nice thing, but that farmland doesn't need to be used towards grazing. It could be used towards much more sustainable types of agriculture, like small-scale ecological veganic farming. However, the other side of that is that a lot of this land could be used for neither one nor the other, ideally. It shouldn't be high-rises or farming. I think that we should be leaving more land just to be wild. For example, in Point Reyes, there's so much farming going on in Marin County anyway, so why does there need to be any farming at all in, in Point Reyes? So I think that here we have a bit of a false dichotomy where we're being sold this idea that these farmers are stewards of the land because we don't have high-rises, but there are really other options. Okay, I'm sitting inside the Elk Reserve and I am looking out across the bay to outside of Point Reyes National Seashore and I'm going to try to count how many dairies are visible just in one headpan from a single standing position. You might not be able to tell without zooming, but there are already cattle in view. This is as far left as the hill allows me to see and it looks like there's one there. I don't know what that is, so I won't count it. Now I see some small livestock, maybe sheep and cows, and a ranch house. If I freeze it here, you can see that that structure on the right is one of those huge loafing sheds. Continue panning, and I realize that, yes, that is sheep. That's a lot of sheep. And another ranch house. A little lower down, we've got a huge barn and a lot of cattle surrounding it. And then we've got some... Ranch house is up on the hill. There's another one. And here is a big one. That's a lot of buildings. Okay, I get down to the shore here and I see some buildings in the front, but that looks like another ranch behind them. And that's as far right as I can see before my view is blocked again. So that many additional dairies were within view just from one standing position. But supposedly we can't spare the dairies within the seashore for both ecological and economic reasons. I think a path to the honest version of economic propaganda would be to force the local community to choose between one of the two economic stimuli generated from the seashore, rather than getting to reap the benefits of both while exploiting one of them. Ecologically speaking, please note the difference in terrain within the elk reserve versus that across the bay and ranched lands within the seashore. The reserve, which has been left to its own devices and free from cattle grazing since 1980, has diverse vegetation and habitat, while the ranch tills across the way look more like a golf course than a habitat. The elk have allowed Pierce Point, the 2,600 acres that they're locked into by an eight-foot fence, to return to more of the condition that existed before any cattle were brought to the Point Reyes area. The coastal prairie that uh, we refer to as something that's desirable and that we would like to return to because it's natural was not just grass. It was a system of various kinds of vegetation that existed on the California coast going in several miles from the ocean. It extended down to San Luis Obispo and as far north as somewhere into Oregon. And it was not just coastal prairie. It was mixed in with coyote brush and related brush-type plants since the beginning of time, or at least uh, prior to European man ever arriving in California. So brush is as native and as good as grass. And in fact, I would argue more so because it serves many more wildlife species than just the grass being good for the elk. Once again, we come to a point of contention, with some sources claiming cattle grazing and ranching can be beneficial to the habitat, such as is highlighted in the park's newly published grazing management plan. Let me be clear, there's absolutely no scenario in which native habitat is better with livestock than without it. Livestock can provide certain 
myopic certain very specific benefits in some instances but overall the land is going to be worse with the with cattle on it if cattle are not native and cattle are not naturally evolved animals so they're not native to anywhere but certainly the western u.s which is a much more fragile ecosystem than back east cattle grazing cannot simultaneously be the single biggest threat to habitat while also being of ecological importance a perfect example of agenda-driven science is the park's recommended grazing plan, and quite frankly, the report is disturbing because I recently witnessed firsthand that the data reported is not accurate. It's simply not true. Former seashore ecologist and director of botanical operations, Barbara Morich, called the grazing plan biased in favor of ranching. The document is focused on managing livestock grazing, which makes one wonder if the Park Service has any intention of seriously considering the alternative that would end ranching during the current General Management Plan Amendment and Environmental Impact Statement process. Indeed, I had to wonder myself as I read the goals section of the document, which again showed emphasis for managing the elk's population and foraging impact, but no mention of concern for the same regarding cattle. While examining this document, something caught my eye that reminded me of a portion of my interview with George Worthner. The people who might question livestock production are not in range departments. They're in botany departments. They're in geology departments. They're in zoology departments. They're not in the, in the range department because you cannot survive in a range department if you question uh, livestock production. I have a friend who was in the Oregon State Range Department, and his motto was, I don't do cows. And he was doing research on riparian areas that showed that cattle grazing had damage to riparians. They eventually pushed them out of the department. What we have here is a park service dedicating resources toward analyzing the least terrible ways to continue doing something terrible. Furthermore, some of the conclusions and recommendations recognized in the grazing plan are the same as from the Raven study of 1999 and the Point Blue Silage Study of 2015. So this is not only a question of why Park Service staff prioritize the continuation of ranching rather than how to end ranching, but a question of why they are already failing to enforce recommended best practices for known issues. So how do I explain the politicians and members of the academic community who not only support ranching, but are members of some of the ranching associations? There are politicians and scientists who are influenced by the grazing and ranching industry, uh, whether it's personally influenced or financially influenced or both. And so that's what they're going to say and that's what they're going to think. As, you know, to paraphrase Upton Sinclair, it's impossible to get someone to realize what they're doing is bad if their living depends on doing it. Always follow the money. And it's not just money. I mean, some people go to ag schools like UC Davis or Texas A&M. If you go to an ag school, your purpose in life is supporting the agriculture, whether it's agribusiness or a family farm or whatever, but you're supporting that kind of thing. And that includes animal agriculture, which is the cattle. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to think, oh, maybe this is bad. But everything's okay because it's historic. Look, established circa 1852. That means it's cultural, it's historic. How could anything be bad about that? This message is prevalent throughout the park, and it seemed I was being reminded at each stop how important the ranches were. By my count, there were as many plaques teaching the public about the ranches as there were about the native wonders of the seashore. The historic status is really part of that package, that's part of that propaganda, where they're presenting the, themselves as wholesome, you know, we're fifth generation farmers, and that really, um, that really is supposed to stress the fact that these guys are really the complete opposite of the large corporate big ag guys. But the fact that they've been here for five generations doesn't make their farming good for the land or, you know, for anything else. If anything, I would argue that that historic status is something kind of terrible because what history are we talking about? I mean, people just think historic and that's quaint and it's, you know, it drives tourism, but it's a terrible history. This is the history of people coming to California, driving out native people and bringing in animals that were harmful to the local ecology. 
One of the problems, I think, with the discourse these days is that sometimes people who promote grazing do recognize that something harmful happened when settlers came in. They say, yes, there used to be bison, and now they're not here, and that's unfortunate. So sometimes there is a recognition of that, but we never see a recognition that those problems are still going on today. On the heels of the recent legal battle, the timing of this historic designation does not appear to be coincidental. The Park Service has uh, taken action to try to create a historic aspect to the ranching at Point Reyes and Golden Gate, at least most of the ranches. But uh, when you think of uh, the ranches and farms throughout America, the Point Reyes and the Golden Gate ranches are no different than any ranches all the way to the New England states and the Atlantic seaboard. In fact, those farms and ranches uh, outdate the ranches in Point Reyes and Golden Gate by one or 200 years. What a historic designation means legally is that they're going to get certain legal protections. So it's going to be harder, if not impossible, to get rid of them if they get historic status. The usual suspects provided vocal support of the designation, including implications that the historic status should also mean that the ranches continue on as working businesses. Congressman Huffman blatantly attempts to sway the public perception in his comments on the matter. Quote, the rest is really important too. The beaches, the lighthouse, the wilderness. Oh, thank you for including the wilderness as being important, Mr. Huffman, environmentalist. But it's important to recognize these historic ranches really have always been part of what Congress set out to preserve and protect out there. And I think this designation really underscores that. From reading his words, one would believe that legislation actually said this, which it did not. He goes on, If the ranches ceased operation, you would lose the working landscapes, the essential character of the place. The participants in the Park Service's surveys don't seem to think it's essential. Tourists, be they local, from out of state, or international, don't seem to think it's essential. In fact, the only people who consider ranches inside a national seashore to be essential to the character of the place are members of the ranching community, of which I dare say Congressman Huffman is an honorary member. In fact, his district director is also a board member of the Agricultural Institute of Marin. Laura Watt, a product of ag schools and member of Resilient Agricultural Group in Marin, mentions the designation is for objects and plants before throwing in, most importantly, the land use itself. The park superintendent welcomed the historic designation, saying that national parks are so much more than sweeping landscapes. They are the keepers of our national heritage, both natural and cultural. That's a lovely quote. But in reality, legislation makes no mention of preservation of culture, but does make it abundantly clear that preservation of the natural environment was a priority. One might think the seashore superintendent would know this, but this is no ordinary seashore. It's a seashore that exists deep in the heart of ag country. But most disturbing is a quote from park architect Paul Engel saying, ongoing ranching sort of helps maintain those things. Sort of helps maintain those things. Okay, so if you have a grazing pasture that transitions into a forest, it's really no longer a pasture anymore, and that would be a negative impact. Ah, the negative impact of a forest neighboring a pasture in a national park. How terrible. Again, where else could we go to get a complete ranching experience? Oh right, almost the entire rest of Marin County. How is it that historic Pierce Point Ranch without working landscapes manages to still be historic? I'm standing inside the no longer functioning historic dairy and somehow, even without seeing cows and without seeing any cows being milked, I'm able to understand the historic significance of this dairy. I don't see the pasture, I don't see animals grazing, and yet somehow I'm able to understand that animals do eat and that then humans milked them and sold that milk. Sort of like how when I go to a museum I'm able to appreciate the art without seeing the artist making the art in front of me. But I have to admit that the presence of these trees was a negative impact and I almost wasn't able to understand what used to take place here. Just as with 
reinterpreting the original intentions of the park to suit the desires of the ranchers, they also attempted to reinterpret what was necessary for historic designation, conveniently claiming the ranches needed to continue working. The law doesn't require that ranching continues. The, the law only, to the extent it has an effect, is that the Park Service consider their historic value before doing anything to harm them. It has nothing to do with continuing the operation of ranches, just protecting those objects that are deemed historic, quote unquote. Arguments claiming that the dairies are an important part of the natural history of the seashore conveniently look to the dairies to start their timeline rather than the history of eradicating native people and wildlife that came before. The education provided on these plaques should be a message of learning from our past mistakes, rather than insisting on continuing with them. We can argue what historic means, what organic means, what sustainable means, what humane means, and we can argue what greed, corruption, and integrity mean. But what are we really arguing? For if we choose to argue on behalf of the profits of an industry that destroys the land and steals babies from mothers, rather than fight to protect one of the last wild places on our coast, then perhaps the battle that really matters has already been lost. As we stepped onto the land here at Point Reyes, one of the most majestic sounds that you will ever hear in the wilderness, in the wild, here on the hillsides of the Point Reyes National Seashore is the call and trumpeting of the Thule Elk. It's powerful, it's tremendous, it moves you spiritually, it sends a chill up your back. And the reason why that does that is it touches your soul. We, as human beings, have destroyed so much around us that we do not stop and think about everything that's living about us. There are birds nesting. There are small mice. There are little cottontails. There are snakes. There are all types of animals that live within this environment that we need to think about and protect. We can't just close our eyes and move about the land and say, everything is okay out here. It is not. Things are happening in a way that is silent. Things are happening in a way where people cover up things. Things are happening in a way where they do not respond to information that's being presented to protect and preserve our beautiful Point Reyes National Seashore. The fog-shrouded coast of Point Reyes invites our imaginations to consider what this land was once like, what the animals were once like, and what it could be like again if we so desired it. That's how much power we have. We can strive for a piece of that lost magic, or we can make this like every other location we've exploited. For me, what's happening in Point Reyes personifies a bigger issue, the bigger picture that we seem to be losing our ability to appreciate or find value in anything unless it's generating money for us. These landscapes are what refresh us, inspire us, even heal us when we take the time to allow them to heal us and play home to the creatures that filled us with giddy excitement as children and in many cases, even as adults. I refuse to believe that there isn't still a part of us that remembers that value. And I refuse to believe that this nation isn't wealthy enough to set aside one small bit of land to preserve something that special.